Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Fedway Associates, Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Verizon Communications. And by the law firm of Gibbons PC. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. I want to introduce you for the first time. Dr. Keith uh, Kensler joins us on one-on-one. -on -one. He is the Surgeon-in-Chief, Joseph M. Sanzari, Children's Hospital, Hackensack University Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Nice to um, be here. Thank you. We're talking about uh, pediatric surgery versus adult surgery. One of the biggest, or some of the biggest challenges or differences between pediatric surgery versus uh, surgery on an adult would be? Uh, there are many. I mean, obviously, the obvious ones are anatomy is smaller, uh, the physiology is different, and the emotional state of the patient is different and there's always a family attached so you have to communicate with many members of the family rather than speaking directly to the patient sometimes. Yeah, it's so interesting. You think about this. I mean, with an adult, you sit with an adult and there are certain procedures. There are risks involved and there's the upside and, and you go through the, all these things and you talk, and you talk it through. With a child, you're not doing that. You're talking to the whole family. Right. How do you train a physician to do that? I think medical schools are starting to attempt to train physicians to do that, but when I went to medical school, there was no formal training in that, so it was kind of what you brought to the table, and I think in some way that was what drew me to pediatric surgery, and it may sort of drive a doctor one way or the other. Well, what drew you? You said it drew you to pediatric surgery. What do you mean? Uh, well, p a big part of pediatric surgery is talking to families and dealing with uh, obviously nervous parents and uh, either you enjoy that or you don't. There's a big difference even with smaller cases that are very routine. They become big worries for, for parents naturally and so if you enjoy that kind of thing that, that's one of the things that draws you to pediatric surgery I think. You know so I, I'm thinking about this. Um, recently I was going through some shoulder surgery and there have been diff different surgeries and, and I was talking to some people about it, and we were talking about bedside manner. And someone says, well, you know, when it comes to surgery, who cares what the surgeon's bedside manner is, as long as he or she is a great surgeon, and you get the operation done, and you get the outcome you want, and that's that. My sense is that's not the same when it comes to pediatric surgery, because, am I, am I missing something here? I think that's definitely true in part, but there is, something to be said for you want both where the right where the where the surgeon trained and his skill set is very important his or her Go ahead. his or her um, however um, there's a lot of it that has to do with the entire family and I think that having a team approach you need the parents to be on your team so in order for, that, for their expectations to be managed and to have them yeah. understand what's about to happen you need to really team up with them right mm -hmm. from the start so that's uh, something that some of us are better than others at, I think. Let's talk about the minimally invasive surgery with um, children. What specifically are we talking about? What sort of minimally invasive surgeries are the most prevalent ones that are helping children today? So at, at this point, almost every operation can be done minimally invasively. And what we mean is what uh, we're talking about laparoscopic surgery and thoracoscopic surgery or keyhole surgery. Keyhole. You know, the, the narrowest incision you, one can make to gain access to the abdomen or the chest and do an operation on the inside of the patient rather than to open an incision to put the surgeon's hands within. 
So that was impossible for little, uh, littler children, toddlers, and infants, uh, especially newborns and even premature infants. Those were impossible to do when the instruments were large and made for adults. So at this point, they had to get smaller. They went from 10 millimeters to five, and now two and three uh, millimeters in diameter. In so they're getting point. narrower? Narrower and shorter. And that allows you to do a whole range of things you here to for, that here to for you couldn't do? That's right. Talk about the outcomes and how they're different through, by using these minimally invasive technologies. Sure. It's hard, it's hard to gauge that because in the last 10 years, it's really exploded. So the long-term outcomes are hard to say. Obviously, with smaller incisions, there's less tissue trauma. There's a lot less pain. Patients can ambulate and avoid uh, staying in bed for long periods of time, and they can participate in their recovery a lot faster. Patients go home a lot faster. So I think those are the tangible things that are, that are obvious right now. Our, our goals as minimally invasive surgeons or minimally invasive pediatric surgeons is always to accomplish the same operation that you would open or better. So that, that's our goal. But that's not always possible. I mean, it, depending upon the individual case, depending upon the challenge that, that the child is facing, sometimes the other more invasive, if I can call it that, surgery is required. Correct. That's right. And, and each case is different, of course. But with a big solid tumor, for example. There's really no way to fit that out of the body. And in times, there, there are at times difficult locations and the safest thing to do is to do that through an open, larger incision. Mm -hmm. And you have to remove a mass that's not compressible. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, taking out a lobe of the lung for a, for a benign lesion, right. we can make very small incisions, remove the lung on the inside, and then mince it up into small pieces in order right. to remove it piecemeal. And finally, the training for you and your colleagues to use this equipment, minimally invasive equipment, is? Uh, is pediatric surgery fellowship and a lot of practice in inanimate labs and, and on animals and, uh, and then people. And the reaction from your colleagues has been? Excellent, yeah, everyone's... They're into this, they want this. Absolutely. And more and more, it's interesting because I always think of the older physicians and surgeons who have not done this, and then they say, well, here it is. They're responding well? They are, and I think that's the key. I'm in a group with older and younger surgeons, and I think uh, I'm sort of in the middle. Um, it's really helpful to have an open, older surgeon in a case that you're doing minimally invasively to offer other perspective on that, mm. and vice versa. Sometimes they have a big case they don't think is mm. doable minimally invasively, and with our help, we can accomplish it. So it's nice to have a team with everybody represented. Dr. Kensler, we appreciate you coming in and sharing. It's a very important topic. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This is One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. was uh, some video, home video, of uh, little Zoe Ganesh. And uh, we are joined now by uh, Karthik Ganesh. And I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, Karthik is the founder of the Zoe Ganesh DIPG Research Fund. And you're going to see a website up throughout this segment. And we'll set up, uh, while we're doing this program, uh, in an effort to raise awareness and uh, hopefully uh, try to make a difference. Um, Zoe Ganesh, your daughter, um, was fine, five years old, and in June 2012, things began to change. So June 2012, she turned five. She graduated from pre-K. Um, she went for her annual physical. Everything turned out extremely well. Then suddenly in August, she started complaining of double vision. Her eyes crossed. Her gait became unstable. We took her to a pediatrician a number of times, and they basically said she might have farsightedness. So we took her to an optometrist. We got glasses on, nothing improved. And um, we took her to um, the ophthalmologist on August 29th at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is you know, the leading institution in the country, in the world, quite frankly. 
and um, they said, you know, her power is very high. We need to get her a higher power glass set of glasses, and um, but doesn't look like there's a tumor here. That Friday, then the following morning, and we would now been done the pediatrician round about five times already. She once again, she she got up in the morning and she puked, and we took her into the pediatrician, and uh, you know, he basically was still trying to figure out what she'd eaten the previous night, and we said no, we need a cat, we need a CT scan done now, and uh, we want to know what's going on. They found a mass in her brainstem. They asked us to go into Philly again to the children's hospital to chop, and. Um, on September 1st, they diagnosed that she had an inoperable brainstem tumor, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, which is um, DIPG. DIPG. Correct. How rare? Very rare. It, um, it occurs in the pons of the brainstem. So, you know, for the folks who don't know, the brainstem controls all of our functions, automatic functions, swallowing, consciousness, heart rate, breathing, and um, it's the oldest part of the brain. She had a brain stem. She had a tumor in the brain stem. Um, it happens to about 200 kids annually. They last anywhere from 12 to 18 months after diagnosis. She didn't make it past her fourth month. It is, um, the survival rate is 0%. So um, it's almost the, the holy grail of cancers. I mean, just to put that in perspective, if detected early, lung cancers today have an 80% survival rate. Breast cancer is 80 to 90 percent. Mm. Even leukemia is now close to 50 percent. This is zero. Zoe struggles. She fights. Um, she's your hero. She is. Um, your son is born, I believe, on November 1st of 2012. That's right. Um, on November 23rd, uh, Zoe asks for ice cream. That's right. One of her last meals, I think. Her last meal was ice cream. And on the 25th, she passes. That's right. Um, and uh, so you lose your daughter, uh, and you make a decision. And we should also make a connection. Or we have a connection through our mutual friend, Annette Catino at Qualcare, and Allison Hoffman, who right. um, we, we all talk about these Absolutely. things in, in, in your situation. A Zoe situation was known by a lot of people. And you decide how quickly that you're going to start this foundation. The next day. And the name of the foundation is? It's the Zoe Gane It's the Lucille Packard Foundation. It's at the, the Stanford University School of Medicine. Why did you have it there? Stanford arguably has one of the most progressive research programs on DIPG right now. I mean, DIPG has been significantly underfunded. Um, there's a parent that actually donated the tumor, the kid's tumor, to Stanford. And Stanford's been working on live tumor tissue for a number of years now. And Dr. Michelle Manje at Stanford you know, arguably has, you know, has uh, more of a start, if you will, than the others in terms of research. And they're doing uh, important work. They're doing very important work. And the name of the foundation is in it's Zoe's name. It's Zoe Ganesh Research Fund at the, the Lucille Packard Foundation. And you put up $100,000 to start? We put up, uh, our target's $100,000. We're right. at 52 right now. Uh, friends, family, strangers, uh, it's, been, um, it's been very, very overwhelming, the level of support for this. And people are going to go on that website that we have right there, and, and uh, they could Google as well. The easiest way is to Google Zoe Ganesh, and it's the first result that shows up. What's your objective? Awareness. This is incredibly underfunded. You know, Neil Armstrong's daughter, died of this in 1959. 54 years later, there still isn't a cure. In the last 30 years, there's been virtually no progress on this. And again, to put it in perspective, the, cancer, the National Cancer Institute spends less than 3% of their funds on pediatric cancers, and a very small percentage of that goes towards pediatric brain tumors. The American Cancer Society spends 70 cents on every $100 that's 0.7% towards pediatric cancers. And again, a very small percentage of that goes towards pediatric brain tumors. This is about awareness. Really hoping, I mean, Jersey is the pharmaceutical capital of the world. I'm really hoping that there's a pharmaceutical exec out there who's watching your show, someone really influential who's watching your show, who thinks to himself, Zoe could be his or her daughter, grandkid, nephew, niece, and says, we've got to do something about this. 
200 kids is in critical mass for some of these pharmaceutical companies right. to be interested. And I'm hoping someone says the heart's more important than the wallet. Your uh, wristband. It's, uh, it's grave for um, pediatric brain cancer. Steve, get a shot of that. I'm going to see if Steve can get it. Say what it is? It's cure DIPG. And brain cancer. Brain cancer. Tell folks just for a minute, just tell them about Zoe. Loved dinosaurs. Loved sharks. Loved ballet. Performed um, to Swan Lake. This is. That's her. She performed on stage to Swan Lake as a part of her pre-K graduation. For a five-year-old, she wanted to be a, a paleontologist ballerina. And um, just incredibly inspirational. I've lost her, but I couldn't be more thankful that she was a part of my life. That's your favorite picture? That is my favorite picture of her. Why? She loved the puffin on it. <laughs> and she looks like the puffin in it. <laughs> Um, for all the parents watching out there, what do you say to them? Pediatricians know a lot. They don't know it all. Trust your instinct. No one knows your kid better than you. And um, if you're not comfortable, don't hesitate to ask. Because um, farsightedness would have been the general rationale for virtually every doc out there. And that wasn't the case. I mean, we knew something was fundamentally wrong with our daughter. And, um, and this was a girl who had absolutely nothing going on that seemed improper, or incorrect, even mm. two months prior to that. So I'll just say, trust your instincts. This could be any of your kids. Karthik uh, Ganesh, founder of the Zoe Ganesh DIPG Research Fund. We thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, hopefully we've raised some awareness and uh, you'll continue to raise money and um, keep us posted, okay? Absolutely, thank you very much. Stay there. Thanks, Carthy. Thank you. We'll be right back right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Stephanie Wall is Northeast Community Development Manager at Wells Fargo. How are you doing? I'm good. You are here to talk about a program called, well, called Wells Fargo City Lift. Mm -hmm. City Lift, talk about that. What is it? So it's a program um, that Wells Fargo developed to, to support sustainable home ownership in a variety of different markets across the country. How does that happen? Make, that, make it specific because we're, as we're putting up information, this is very valuable information for people who say, hey, wait a minute, I want in on this. Right. What is it? How does it work? So it primarily is a down payment assistance program. It focuses on potential homeowners who are mortgage ready, could be in a home, uh, but don't have the resources for the down payment. And so it focuses on a city limit type of scenario um, where we just wrapped up one in Baltimore. We're about to um, release one in New Jersey and New York. It focuses on city limits where individuals... What does that mean, city limits? So, for example, New York City limits. Yes. And so individuals that can register and become qualified for the down payment assistance will look to be buying in Newark. And so you get the support of the down payment assistance dollars with the purchase happening in a relatively small geography versus it being diluted if the geography were larger. So you really try to focus in areas where people traditionally and historically, Stephanie, have had a very hard time having the money, the resources to have that down payment. Well, it's cross-cutting because it's not just, it's not limited to who the homeowner is with the exception of um, there being an income limit up to 120% of area and median, median income. So right. in a Newark, that's almost $100,000 for a family of four. So it runs the range. It's, it's meant to be homeownership across the board right. that impacts neighborhood stabilization. It has to be a primary home, though. It has to be a primary. Um, you can be moving out of another location into the city, um, but if you're moving out of a house, you have to sell that one before you move into that location. It's not for investors. It's meant to be for homeowners. Uh, the down payment assistance grant is a five-year forgivable grant. What does that mean? It means that 20% of that grant goes away 
each year for five years, the intention is to keep the home owner in the home. So we want sustainable home ownership, not just moving into a home and then and moving back out a year later. What has been the response to date? It has been a sellout. It's incredible. Um, we've met an unbelievable amount of diverse individuals who have utilized this. Um, great testimonials. It's an incredible opportunity. I, you know, in all the years I've been in community development, I have never seen a $15,000 down payment grant opportunity. And it can be layered with local employer assisted down payment programs. Uh, make that real for us. Give us a for instance. So some um, large employers like hospitals, universities are looking to have their employees live close to where they work. Right. And so they offer some sort of a, a, a grant that might be matched by a city or it might just be their own grant if that individual looks to buy in that particular neighborhood or area of the city. So that can be layered on top of, in the case of New Jersey, $15,000 for down payment. Unbelievable. I'm curious about this. Why is there such a sense of responsibility about, quote, community building? I think Wells Fargo does a lot of work in, in the communities across this country. Um, it's well known that we could not do well if the community did not do well. We have a commitment to restabilization with the foreclosure crisis. You know, there's a lot of um, risk in our neighborhoods. And so we've done a lot of work in the home preservation space, trying to keep people in their homes, in their mortgages. The flip or, or the complement to that is the home ownership piece. So the people that are there, you want to keep in their homes. All of those other available housing units, you want to get new homeowners in and stabilize the, the neighborhood. And so that's really, it's the, it's the combination of those two efforts that really make a difference and really is sustainable. Some folks watching who may be skeptical of banks, could you imagine that possibility? <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> can you imagine that possibility? I can imagine that possibility. Someone says, okay, well, they're just trying to, try to get people to, to get more mortgages with their bank, you say. So the end mortgage does not need to be Wells Fargo. It can be. I, I, don't, I don't see how that it works. So the, the events where we do a, a Lyft event, the customer registers online, they show up at the event, they sit down with one of our home mortgage consultant, consultants to get pre-qualified, or if they have a pre-qualification from another institution, they can bring it with them. And then they get qualified for the down payment and then they go look for a home, essentially. And so the end mortgage can be Wells Fargo, or it could be- It could be a competitor. Another, yep. That doesn't matter. And it has been, <laughs> in some cases, absolutely. This is Wells Fargo's commitment to restabilization in our communities, period, end of story. Okay, so in terms of the, the inventory, I wanna be clear on this, because I wanna make sure if people follow up on this, they know what is possible and what isn't. In terms of the inventory of, of homes that are available to people, what's um, doable, what's not? I mean, what, what can you try to purchase and what can't you based on what? So it's really based on your income limit, so up to 120% of area, in, area median income, but then what you're qualified for, right? So you sit down with a mortgage consultant and they pre-qualify okay. you for a certain amount of dollars. Okay, so it's an amount, it's not, you say, you, I'm looking at a certain house, you go, I like that house, and someone says, well, that house is a million dollars. Right. You have to be pre-qualified to purchase it, of course. And so that's all based on affordability. So whether or not an individual comes to the event and is pre-qualified by a home mortgage consultant with Wells Fargo, or if they have it from another institution, it's all being uh, they're all being pre-qualified on affordability so that they can in fact afford that home. We've found in many cases the sweet spot is somewhere north of 150,000, maybe 200,000, depending on the neighborhood or the city that we're in. Um, that seems to be you know, what we're seeing the most uh, as far as attending these events. Okay, the other part I'm curious about here is for people, is this often first time? It's both. It's sometimes first time homeowners, but also people who are going from where they are mm -hmm. to another place. Correct. But I'm curious, go back, to, stay on the first time homeowners. Um, Stephanie, for a lot of folks, how hard is it to make that adjustment financially as well as in terms of your mindset to be a first time homeowner, particularly in these incredibly difficult economic times? So a big transition from always having a landlord, right? That's to what I'm to being at. the landlord. <laughs> right. Um, from renter to, to hey, owner. I'm responsible for all of it. Right. You don't go knocking on the landlord's right. door. You don't go calling <laughs> the landlord. It's you. 
So there is a home buyer counseling component to this that is a requirement. And so for the individuals who participate, get pre-qualified for a mortgage, get, get approved for their down payment assistance, they must participate in eight hours of face-to-face -face home buyer education. They must complete that as home part of Home buyer education? Correct. So what that is is the discussion with the homeowner around what it means to own a home, what you'll need to understand, and it's the counseling element, I think, that, has ma that makes those situations much more successful. So in the home ownership world, if you talk to individuals who have had counseling prior to actually being a homeowner, very often they have great success. The percentages are very high. Versus folks who make that transition from renter to buyer and never have a conversation with anyone and then you know the hot water heater breaks. Right. <laughs> and what do so I do now? And it could really be a problem. And so the home ownership counseling, the home buyer counseling piece is a huge component. Um, and I think what will make this very successful over time. Where, where, where do folks get that information? We only have a few seconds left. Where would folks get that information? So the, all that information is on the website. It so, is. So the website that we've been putting up, people can get that information. All the details. How, by the way, before I let you out of here, how rewarding is this for you? You've been doing this kind of work for a long time. What's it like for you? Unbelievable. And it's, it's, I think it's one of the key programs that is restabilizing these neighborhoods that have been impacted by vacant and foreclosed you know, housing and the foreclosure crisis. It's been very, very difficult for, we've been doing a lot of this work since 2008, 2009. So it's been a long time and it's great success story. Very exciting, great testimonials. Hope to do a lot more of it. Well, it's just one thing to talk about foreclosures. It's nice to talk about a positive story. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephanie Wall. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Fedway Associates, Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, Cohn Resnick, New Jersey Natural Gas, Verizon Communications, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger and NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. For 17 years, the Russell Berry Foundation has recognized unsung heroes in New Jersey who have done extraordinary things for others. If you know a New Jersey resident whose selfless or heroic actions make them worthy of recognition, you can nominate them to receive the Russell Berry Making a Difference Award. With annual cash prizes of up to $50,000, this award can make a significant difference for a very deserving person. Nominations are accepted online.